All right. Ladies and gentlemen, here I am. You're not used to seeing me, but um, I was asked to do a couple of uh, issues for the Harlem Health and Wellness, Harlem Holistic Health and Wellness Week. Um, it's been an interesting day. We had two shows earlier, Dr. Flora, and uh, I call her Dr. Bailey. She's not Dr. Bailey, but she she's Dr. Bailey to us. Um, and they did their shows earlier, outstanding. And now it's my turn to bring down the curtain and to close it out. And uh, I have the uh, incredible pleasure of introducing uh, a brother who uh, I had the pleasure of meeting some years ago, but um, never had a chance to really have a lot of full detailed conversation because he's so busy. And when I see him, he's all, he's usually in and out um, being a, a client of my sister. So, um, you know, he's very financially secure and wise because he does that, but um, this brother is a medical doctor uh, of extreme proportions. Um, and I am going to bring him in right now so that we can get this started. And ladies and gentlemen, I am bringing to you live from Soul City, my conversation today with Dr. John Badero. Dr. Badero, how are you today? Not as good as you, but I thank God, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not quite sure. It might be debate about that later, but... Um, I appreciate you being here today with us. Um, what we're trying to do with Harlem Holistic Wellness Week is to bring information to the people about wellness from a 360 degree viewpoint, um, from a from a holistic viewpoint. Um, there is Western medicine, there is Eastern medicine, and there's medicine in, in between. Um, a lot of opinions, a lot of people who are living different lifestyles. So we try to conversation and bring forth all the different things that are happening health wise and you are probably the cream of the crop um, of uh, so many people I can bring on um I'm gonna start off this way ladies and gentlemen Dr. Darrow is um uh, for what I know and it goes how a little bit of knowledge I know it's gonna be fun here Dr. Badero is a specialist in cardiology and nephrology um, uh, two of two of his specialties. Well, doctor, you told me something earlier. We were talking before we came on the air. Show showed how knowledgeable I was. Who you were. I said, "Oh my God, uh, you are not just a specialist in two areas. You are a specialist in say it." Some areas. I'll just put some areas. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, tell the number, please, because mm -hmm. I was shocked when I heard the number. It's probably you don't mind. Six or seven. I'll say seven. Six or seven. All right. So the six or seven, uh, especially the six or seven areas of, of, of medical, of medicine or medical profession, whatever you want to call it. So I told him I felt like a slacker. I thought I was doing some pretty good things in my life. And if I died tomorrow, I lived a full life and did some stuff. But uh, I got to catch up. So I got to open up six more businesses and uh, do some things. Uh, but Dr. Badero, you on a serious note, you are... You've been doing this for quite a while now, and um, um, just give us a little background on you uh, as a child. You, you, were, you were not born here in America, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so just give us a quick background on your childhood, your life, and how it led you into the medical field. Well, thanks, Mike, for bringing me on. It's a pleasure to be here, and I just want to say hello to all the uh, people that are watching right now and just... I want to encourage everybody to stay strong and stay safe. It's a tough situation, but we're very strong and uh, we're going to pull through. So kudos for everybody and you know, just keep doing the right thing. So um, to answer your question, um, I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria is part of West Africa. You know. uh, Lagos uh, was the capital at the time. Um, it was a great time. Um, I grew up with, uh, it was a large family. Uh, I had uh, eight other siblings, uh, middle income family. Um, my dad worked hard. My mom worked hard. She was in the banking industry. She's, you know, she retired. Um, education was very big, um, as it is in you know most African countries, um, because usually that's your way out of poverty. Um, you know, the resources are not, you know, uh, a lot to go around to, mm -hmm. for a lot of the people. So um, a lot of social services are not there like we have in the United States. So uh, if you don't have an education, it's very difficult for you to get by. You know, the entertainment, the entertainment industry was not as great, 
as it is here in the United States. So really, but things are changing now. But back in those days, you know, you just have to find a way to to get some education and do you know something with your life. So education was very big for my parents. Um, it was something they stressed a lot, um, and I'm I'm thankful that I had that opportunity. Um, education wasn't very expensive at the time, you know. Uh, some some of us went to school uh, went to school for free. Uh, some you know, parts of the edu- you know educational career um, stage at the time as well. So, but it was fun time. We had fun. You know, I had a lot of friends. I used to play soccer. I used to run around. I was very playful. You know, just fun times. Yeah. Okay. And so during those fun times, and mix those fun times with your educational times. Uh, you know, your parents make you study and to you know. Uh, really clamp down on your on your learning. Um, what was it that brought you to medicine to want to become a doctor? So, um, interesting question. I never wanted to be a doctor, you know. Um, mm-hmm. I was very playful when I was in school. Um, and, um, but I never wanted to be a doctor. I actually wanted to be an engineer, <clears throat> excuse me, you know. And uh, my dad, you know, he wouldn't have it. He told me, I want you to be a doctor. And, and you know, back in the days, African parents, you know, they always try to tell you, you know, it's either you're an engineer, lawyer, doctor, something like that, you know, and they really want you to be something. And, you know, sometimes if very, it's a lost battle. I mean, you do mm-hmm. what they tell you to do, but, you know, I was very close to my dad. So I was one of the few kids that could really um, disagree with him because, you know, he was a very nice man, very charismatic, but he was very stern, very strict, you know, so you don't disagree with him, you know, but I was very close to him. So I said, no, I don't want to be a doctor, you know, I said I wanted to be an engineer and, um, it was back and forth and back and forth. And then um, there was this evening, um, everybody, all my siblings were asleep. And he called me into his room. And uh, he told me, you know, um, if you study medicine, you're going to follow the path of your destiny. Um, and you're going to do something great for humanity. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then lastly, he said, um, and my blessings will go with you. Uh, but, but if you don't do it, I, mean, I can't guarantee you that my, my blessings will be with you, you know, so... Really, right. that was the reason why I did medicine because I, I wanted his blessings because I know that was very important, you know. And uh, okay. when I got into med school, obviously, you know, I wasn't, I didn't need to attend classes. I mean, I was very playful because I it wasn't what I wanted to do, you know. And I felt you could go to medical school without going to class, you know, which is a very mm-hmm. concept, you know, eventually. But you know, I, I got my bearings back, you know, and I eventually I applied myself to it, you know, and um, here I am. Okay, so. I know as a child, kind of had a similar situation that you had, and but I was probably a little more uh, less disciplined than you were. Uh, my mother wanted me to be a, a, a lawyer, and I actually wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, it was either a lawyer or a psychiatrist. Then I realized that psychiatrists are crazy, and I didn't want to choose kids in psychiatry and the legal profession. I was like, mm, really don't want to do that. I wanted to be a rock star, and uh, you know. <laughs> And, you know, I guess through my junior high school years, you know, my mother would fight with me. To, uh, all right. And then finally, she, she just gave up. I was really good at music and I was good at sports. I didn't want to play football or, or play music. That was my destiny, I thought. Um, here I am doing something totally different. But um, uh, you like MMA, right? You like the MMA. You're, you know. So, well, yeah, you know, M- M- MMA, if I was younger, I probably would be. In the MMA fighting, if, if if I was younger, um, now I, I I would not do it. I I would get killed right now. So <laughs> I wouldn't do it <laughs> often. Um, but you know, I think as a child, when you got into medicine, and or you know, as a I guess at that point you wasn't even as a child, but in your teens or you know your late teens that you were uh, studying medicine, are you happy you did it now? Do you actually like medicine? Um, you know. Embraced it because you, I mean, I'm assuming you got you know, but yeah, I mean, after investing 20 years, I think, uh, I think I had no choice, <laughs> no, but really, yeah, but really, I do love medicine because I think, um, you know, medicine gives you it's, um, it's, it's a honor, it's not, you know, we don't, we shouldn't take it lightly, you know, the ability to, uh, to put smiles on people's faces, to help someone in need, to take care of someone especially when they're very vulnerable they put a lot in your hands uh but ultimately god is one that heals you know we just we as, as physicians mm-hmm. we just take care of people we should never forget that you know uh but but nonetheless it's always a very uh it's a humbling experience just being up you know your place to 
to help someone in need. Because I, I think that, you know, uh, service to mankind uh, is the rent that we pl we pay for a place here on earth. You know, we come to this earth, we didn't pay any, any price, we didn't pay anything. And we're here mm -hmm. to pay something, you know? And if you can help mm -hmm. somebody else, that's the rent you pay for just coming here for free. You didn't pay any price to come here, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and really we should help each other. And I think that, um, as an artist, because that's another thing, I'm an artist, you know, I paint and I write a lot. You know? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Here we go. Yeah, because I, I, I believe that, you know, the, the, now, okay. no, no, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just being 100. You know, I'm just being 100. You know? <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I always feel the footage of my mind is ice in the quiet of my thoughts. So I have mm -hmm. a good mind that is ice, ice in the thoughts, and art is a way that it brings it out. So, you know, it, for me, um, if you have a creative mind, uh, the wealth of that creativity has to be able to translate into making a difference in people's lives. So what that means, if you, if you have a creative mind and you cannot make a difference in the lives of people, there's no wealth to that creativity. And right. as a doctor, you know, as a physician, a healthcare worker, nurse, whatever, whatever have you, um, the ability to make a, a difference in, in sickness and health is one of the greatest wealth that you can have, you know. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's it's, it's a great thing. I mean, I think it's a humbling experience. Uh, it's not something I take for granted. I'm blessed. I'm thankful to God for that opportunity to serve the community, to serve the people that I meet with every single day of my life. And that's, you know, and, and it's funny you say that because I believe that uh, medicine, we forget and don't look at medicine holistically, but everything that you can do as you say to serve somebody or to help somebody is medicine. And in some form of, of, of fashion, um, uh, I mean, as a kid, I was a class clown when I was a kid, and um, but I was a class clown because I always liked to laugh, and I always liked making other people laugh. And then I learned that there was a, there's a phrase, laughter is the best medicine, and so I always just thought to make people laugh because that felt it was making them feel good and it made me feel good. So, you know, it's a free exchange. Um, and laughter is healing. Music is healing, um, which is one of the reasons why I love music. Music is very healing to people. Um, it's a story about a man who was in a nursing home and couldn't talk or wouldn't talk like, you know, 20 years. And then somebody played some music that he recognized and it sparked something in him and he perked up and started playing music on the piano and you know what have you so you know and they say you know was it music soothes the uh, savage beast um so anything that you can do to help people i think is some form of fashion a form of medicine um there's some people who just speak real cool and will tone to the voice and it makes you you know feel good just to listen to them so um but in your medical practice, now you went to school here in America or in Nigeria? So I, I did med school in Nigeria and um, and then I came here. Um, and I did 10 years of postgraduate training uh, nonstop, uh, which is, you know, it's kind of, it was quite intense. Um, um, I didn't choose the field, the field chose me. You know, a lot of people ask me, okay. you know, uh, why did you do 10 years? What were you trying to achieve? What were you trying to do? Um, why did you do all these fields of medicine? It wasn't something I chose, you know, cardiology chose me. Um, I wanted to just be a cardiologist initially, uh, but then I had a lot of adversities. I've always had adversity, you know, mm -hmm. most of my life, actually, even, even when I was a child, just, you know, um, you know, coming to this world, there was adversity. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't come at nine months, you know, I was sick when I was a child, I almost died. You know, I lost my younger sister when she was uh, nine months old. I lost my younger brother who was closest to me when he was, when I was in final year of mm -hmm. medical school. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, I didn't even get a chance to celebrate being a physician because he passed away. You know, and oh, wow. I remember on my way back, you know, uh, just to break the news to my parents that I passed my my uh, final exams in med school, you know, I had an accident. I had a motor vehicle accident and I almost passed away in the accident as well. So. Um, mm -hmm. I've worked these. I'm not. It's not. They're not new to me. Nobody likes it. But you know, I've gotten used to them. And I was. I, I believe it's a sign of greatness. Um, if you're not going somewhere, um, the enemy is not going to come after you. You're not going to have adversity. It's, it's usually when you're going somewhere. Think about it. If you're going backwards, you don't have to drag somebody who's going backwards backwards, right? They're already free falling anyway. So you only drag mm -hmm. going forward backwards. So, um, so yeah. So you know, 
adversities and eventually I got to where I wanted to go to, but I think it was all part of destiny. Hmm. And you know, so, all right, so yeah, destiny. So cardiology, you said nephrology called you. You were doing cardiology already and then nephrology said, hey, come no, on, take a look at us. No, actually, I wanted to, actually, I wanted to do cardiology. And, um, and there were people that stood in my way. That's just the reality of the situation, you know. Uh, for some reason, mm -hmm. they wanted to do cardiology. Now, cardiology was very competitive at the time, you know. And I applied to nephrology, and they called me right away. Um, okay. So I, I went into the nephrology, and then the opportunity to do the cardiology presented itself. And I didn't need to take it at that point because I was I'd been accepted for nephrology, for interventional nephrology, which was a new thing at the time. And uh, I was also been accepted for an MCRC program at uh, Rollins School of Public Health and Emory. So really, I didn't need to do cardiology at the time because, you know, um, I would have been okay just doing nephrology and doing the things that I was doing. Uh, but, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was a passion of mine and um, I never liked to fail. Um, I always tell people fail, the, def the definition of the word fail is first attempt in learning. It's okay mm -hmm. to fail. It's part, of the, yeah. it's part of success, you know. And I don't like to leave anything on the table. You know, um, I've, I've, always, I've always been a very competitive person since I was a child. You know, I competed with myself against somebody else. So I went back mm -hmm. and I did cardiology when I knew it was going to take a lot of time, effort, sacrifice, things like that. Right. So eventually I had to go do it. Yeah. Okay. So just so we can explain to people, we were, I think you know, cardiology deals with the heart. And uh, that's your heart uh, specialty. Nephrology, if I'm not mistaken, deals with the kidney, correct? Yeah, the two kidneys, yes. Okay, so, um, and my understanding, there's not too many people in the world who are specialists in both of those, if I'm not mistaken. I, I actually read an article on you that, that popped up one time on my timeline. I said, hey, I know him. That was about back in the summer. And I read it and, and gave you all your accolades. Um, but not too many people, not too many doctors actually are specialists in both fields, correct? That's a rarity. Well, you know, I don't focus on that. I mean, I, I've been told there's, you know, nobody else has done it, but, you know, I don't really, I don't focus mm -hmm. on that. Um, so uh, you don't focus on, I'm going to focus on it. No one else has done it. Yeah, <laughs> no, no. You're the only one then. There's not even anybody else. You. Well, you know, I don't focus on the word only. Okay. Right. Again, again, it's an opportunity to take care of people. But the thing about this, the, the what what's fascinating to me is, the heart is very fascinating. It's a very fascinating organ because it beats, right? If you take a human heart out of the body and put it on the ground or the table, it's going to continue to beat by itself for some time. That's fascinating, mm -hmm. right? Now, if you look at the kidneys, so the heart is on top and you've got the two kidneys at the bottom. So it's like a triangle, okay? So I call it the, the medical triangle or the medical trinity. So okay. in spirituality, you know, in, in Christianity, we talk about the Holy Trinity. I talk about the medical trinity because you have the heart on top and you have, you have the two kidneys at the bottom. And what's so fascinating is what I call the concept of the purification of power and the power of purification. The heart is very powerful, right? The heart, the heart pumps blood to everywhere in the body and the kidneys mm -hmm. purify the blood. So there's power and there's purification. And I think that mm -hmm. human beings, that's a concept that we always should try to live by. Because a lot of times when power comes, purification disappears. You know, and so the heart and the kidneys are very, very connected. Probably the mm. two organs in the body that are mostly connected together is the heart and the kidney. Mm. You know, uh, knew that. Never. yeah, 20 to 30 percent of your blood volume that comes out of your heart goes through the kidneys. That tells you how important the kidneys are. Oh, wow. OK, that's yeah, you learn something new every day. I definitely didn't know that. Maybe some of you out there who are listening might be a little smarter than I mean, you knew that. But uh I did not know how closely related they were. Um, so um, I, if someone has a heart part, and I remember when I was a kid, um, my I think uh, the doctor told me that I had a heart murmur at the time. Um, and you know, so I'm still here. And, and uh, you know, we played sports and martial arts and all the other stuff and ran like a fool. Um, is there is that something to be concerned about? Because now you know if it is, I'm coming to see you tomorrow. Well, so, you know, uh, <laughs> well, you know, especially in childhood, not 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 every mama, not not every mama is um, is uh, patholo you know pathology that has pathology. You know what I mean? So we've got innocent murmurs, especially in childhood. You know, some kids have innocent murmurs, which really don't really mean anything. Um, 
but when the murmurs become persistent, and there's, a, there's some different types of murmurs, you know, we have diastolic murmurs, systolic murmurs, that's just, you know, the medical term. Diastolic mm-hmm. murmurs are usually pathological, you know. So when okay. you have a systolic murmur, especially in childhood, it might not be anything, uh, but again, if it persists in adulthood, you know, then you need to get it checked out. But not every murmur is, uh, is, is um, you know, has a bad prognosis or, you know, it's, it's a bad thing. Are there any, I'm, I'm not quite sure that there's, there's a full list, but are there any particular foods that you sh- really shouldn't eat before you, because of your heart and, and your kidneys? Now, I know it's probably a long list. There's a long list of foods. <laughs> um, I think to just simplify, just stay away from fried foods. You know, in the South, okay. where, which is where I'm at, you know, we love we love fat, you know, fried foods. Okay, well, okay. I'm yeah. guilty of fried foods. Wow. We're, all, we're all guilty of it, you know. Um, but you know, we should stay away from fat, you know, fried foods. Um, okay. There are better ways to make your food. You can bake, grill, boil. You know, uh, you want to stay from oil. You know, really. Um, Carbohydrates, you know, you want to really steal from carbs. You know, don't don't eat a lot of carbs. You know, eat a lot of protein, vegetables. Um, you know, it's very interesting. I was telling someone the other day. You know, when you're younger, you don't have money, and you want to eat as much as you want. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't really eat as much as you want, rather because you don't have the money. And then you get older, right. you have the money, but you can't eat the food. <laughs> you know, right. it's very interesting, right? But but really, you know, just stay from heart and carbs. You know, protein. Um, you know, vegetables better. Um, stay from refined sugars. Stay from mm-hmm. processed food as much as you can. Uh, we should start going back to really making our foods. You know, um, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, stay away from very high salt. You know, uh, mostly the hypertension in Black people and African Americans uh, is what we call salt-dependent hypertension, which is a bit different from the Caucasians. So, um, so as African Americans, we should stay away from a lot of salt because that's something that drives, you know, part of our hypertension as well. So basically, low, you know, stay from salt, avoid carbs if you can, uh, eat a lot of vegetables, um, eat a lot of protein, don't fry your food, don't fry your water, you know, because you, you fry everything, right? You know, and then, you know, I mean, just avoid processed foods as much as you can, you know. Um, yeah. I know the burgers are there and things like that, but, you know, um, really they're not very healthy. And that's the reality. Sure. Yeah. It's funny, and uh, you you will probably be proud of me. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a coincidence or not. Uh, maybe somewhere in my consciousness, it, it, I did it. But I cooked tonight. I didn't eat yet because then we get oils out and then I'll eat. But I baked chicken. I didn't fry it. I baked it. So uh, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Give me a standing ovation. I take the <laughs> bows now. Um, uh, I did bake. I actually love baked chicken anyway, you know, but I do admit I do like fried chicken. I try not to eat it that much because I know it's not good. I like fried fish, and uh, but I try not to eat it as much. Um, but I know there's a lot of things, low sodium. Now you mentioned uh, black people and Caucasian people, the differences in our diets. Is this, is that just because we have different DNA or different chemical make? We certain foods affect us differently, or just that we just eat food more. Are you talking about our diet? Why is our diet different? Yeah, yeah. Well, as far as our diets, I, I think it's you know cultural. You know, there's it's a lot of you know, you know, it dates back to slavery, right? Um, you know, there were things that Africans were eating, and um, you know, when Africans came here, you know, the story mm-hmm. tell us the history actually tell us that you know. Um, Blacks were given, like the blacks were on the, plant, on the plantation, they were given the things that, you know, the Caucasians didn't want to eat, like, you know, um, you know, the, the parts of the animals that were not very great. Right. Chitlin, right. and that kind of stuff. The chitlin, yeah. and, you know, and the, um, and the pork chops and the, you know, and, pork the pizza yeah. and all this kind of stuff, you know. I got pork chop in the pot right now. Right. So, 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 you know, and, and so they had to improvise, right? How are you going to mm-hmm. make pork chop, you know, very sweet. How are you going to make peak feet sweet? It's not even sweet, right? So when you fry it, it's sweet. Wow. Right? And so that's how a lot of the, you know, things were developed. So it's really cultural evolution uh, pretty much in, in, in the history uh, that has really influenced the way we, we, you know, we've eaten and things like that. And, um, right. yeah. I was just talking to somebody on Facebook the other day. Somebody put an article about Van Jones and how a lot of people are coming down on him because he made the statement about Black people 
don't eat healthy and, you know, was blaming black people for having diabetes and hypertension and all these other ailments because we don't eat properly. And I was like, well, you know, he's correct. But the deeper issue is it's a psychological issue. And like you said, it's a cultural, it's become a cultural uh, issue because uh, that stems back from slavery and we have to go back to that and get people to understand, you know, why you do things and why you probably shouldn't do it. Right. And, 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 and also you can't, you can't deny the fact that, you know, I mean, we, historically we've always had, you know, we've always been placed in low socioeconomic uh, uh, a group, right? And, you know, what work in the plantation, how much is it making? You have kids to feed, you know, so, you know, the foods that we eat are usually cheaper foods, right? Because you want to just take care of your family. Um, mm-hmm. Not necessarily, you know, good for us, but, you know, so I don't think it's, I wouldn't blame anyone. It's not our fault. I mean, it's it's something where, it was the hand of were dealt, really. Um, mm-hmm. It's just a way to survive. You know, it's survival, right? You eat whatever mm-hmm. you can get. You know, the fastest, cheapest thing that I you can do yeah. is, is what you eat. I mean, the man had to go work, and then the woman had to go work, and there's no time to make anything. There's no time to cook anything. Um, so exactly, you know, what do you think is going to happen? We're going to be eating burgers and eating fast food and things like that, you know, because we are strong people and we're trying to make a difference. I mean, you have families to feed and you're going to take care of your kids first, you know? So, I mean, it's, it's not our fault in entirely, I mean, it's the entirety, but I think it's time for us to start, you know, digging deep and looking at our history. You know, Theodore Roosevelt said, you know, said, um, um, when you study more of the, of the past, you become more equipped to face the future. So we mm-hmm. have to look at our past and study our past and see how can we move forward. It's time to start moving forward from all those things and, and basically taking care of ourselves and taking care of our health, you know? Um, yeah. We talked earlier, uh, before we came on, you know, we're talking about, uh, and it, it, it just will lead me into what we probably should eat more of. And, you know, like I told you, like, I drink like two gallons of water every day. I drink two gallons of water every day. And um, I got that from my grandmother. Cause she always walked around the house drinking water and all day long. Lived, she lived to one twelve, right? One twelve. Yeah, one hundred twelve years old. And, 12 years old. and uh, yeah, so when I got that from her, um, and one of my aunts, one of my favorite aunts, just passed away this weekend uh, of oh, COVID nineteen. Yeah. We'll get into that in a second. Oh, wow. um, but she was one hundred one years old. Oh wow. Yeah, so you know, if people say, "Oh, she died," I said, "Yeah," and she was 101 years old, you know, uh, and she ate very well um, and and ate real healthy. So, are there foods that we should make more? I mean, we spoke about eating the non-fatty foods, the fried foods, any particular foods that we should eat more for our, our heart and kidneys. You know, I'm, I'm assuming green leafy, green leafy vegetables and things like that. We should have more, uh, drink more water. But anything else that we should really pay attention to that's good for us. Well, so you, so you can never go, you can never go wrong with water. I mean, you just heard. Right? You drink water. Right. You, you drink, you drink water, and you live to 112 years old. So, so folks, um, drink, right. drink water. Let's go to 112, right? So, yeah, you know, drink mm-hmm. a lot of water. I mean, drink one bottle with each meal. Um, uh, you just mentioned the leafy vegetables. Um, Fiber is good, you know, it helps your digestive system, you know. I find oatmeal to be very great in the morning. Um, stay from sugar, you know, you use honey if you can. I mean, you don't really need sugar, just to, you know, take honey. Um, and just a lot of protein, fish, um, chicken, stay from red meat. Red meat is not good for your heart, really. Um, and, um, and then we can't lose out of exercise as well, you know. And, and most importantly is what, what I tell a lot of people, especially my patients, you got to count, you got to start counting calories. You've got mm-hmm. to start counting the calories because it's not just, mm-hmm. it's not, again, it's not just what you eat. It's also, you know, the amount of what you eat. And when we talk about amount, we're not talking about the servings. I mean, the servings is part of it, but you also have to look at the calories because that's the, that's the currency of, um, of energy or weight in human beings is calories. Um, mm-hmm. Whatever you eat is going to be broken down to calories, you know, um, your body needs 2,000 calories averagely uh, to function in a day. Um, so like I tell people, if you want to lose weight, just eat, eat 1,500 calories a day, 1,200 calories a day, you know, and you're mm-hmm. going to lose the weight because the body's going to find a way to get the calories from somewhere. It's going to take it from your fat anyway. Um, mm-hmm. so, so we got to make the habit of anytime you want to eat something, whatever you're going to put inside your body, make sure you know exactly how much calories it is. And then you're going to be, you know, in charge of your in charge of your health and yourself. Really. 
So in that caloric, uh, in that caloric intake, um, uh, we we want to count the calories. We want to make sure that what eating, exercising is very very important. Uh, that your heart healthy. Um, does exercising itself have uh, an effect on on your kidneys, or just because your heart is healthy, your kidneys will stay healthy? Well, indirectly, because you know, so the slower you move, the faster you die, right? The slower you mm -hmm. move, the faster you die. Um, obesity has been related, to, has been linked to uh, kidney disease. Um, so mm -hmm. if you're obese, it's a risk factor of having kidney disease. There's some certain kind of, of kidney disease that you know we put in the urine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you exercise mm -hmm. and you can, you know lose weight is going to help your kidneys anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, you know, the, 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 the less toxic, you know, materials we present to your kidneys to filter, the less you overwork the kidneys. When you're obese, your kidneys actually overwork themselves. When you're diabetic, mm -hmm. when you're diabetic, when you have diabetes, your kidneys actually overwork themselves. In fact, that's one of the earlier stages of uh, kidney disease from diabetes, we have what is called hyperfiltration. The kidneys begin to hyperfiltrate, you know. So, yeah, exercise is going to help you, you know, your heart, your kidney, definitely. And anything that you do, if you can lose weight, uh, your body is going to be in a better shape. Definitely. So, and, and, and I'm assuming drinking water, again, the water part is good for you, for your, for your kidneys. By drinking yeah, the water. There's a, reason why 60, there's a reason why 60 to 70% of our body mass is water. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you drink waters, I mean, it helps everything. It helps digestion. It helps purification. It helps the filtration. It helps the kidney. The kidney needs water to do what it needs to do. It needs volume. Mm -hmm. You know, when the mm -hmm. kidney doesn't have volume, it clamps down and then it starts having problems. That's why mm -hmm. when the heart fails, the kidney is going to fail. So because if the blood, if the heart doesn't pump enough blood to the kidneys, the kidney doesn't have anything to work with. It's going to start having problems. So, and water's a volume. So, so definitely, um, Drinking water helps uh, to, to filter, to purify, to help your, help your digestive processes. And, you know, if you eat and you don't drink a lot of water, you have constipation anyway. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so water is, you can't go wrong. You right. know, there's, right. there's nobody's, I mean, uh, water is nobody's enemy, right? No, water is everybody's friend. There's nobody that's, you know, that doesn't like water. So. Right. And that's pure water, ladies and gentlemen. Water with, without sugar in it. Uh, water with lemon by itself is fine. Not, water, water, not, water, is, not not soda uh, water. Not not, not soda, soda water. water. Not soda water. Not but water. Water, 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 that's good. Not, not, water, water. Not, not vodka water. Okay. Not well, vodka. vodka water. Say, now you hit me with hurts and stuff. You said not vodka water. <laughs> uh, matter of fact, that's why I stay away from that brown. Uh, that that brown liquor has more sugar in it than white liquor. So. I can get away with that once in a while. I mean, you, right? can drink, you, can drink, you can drink alcohol if you want to, but you know everything in moderation. I mean, there's not. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. So now, in, in, let's get to the to the to the sign of times right now. We're in this uh, quarantine period um, with COVID nineteen, and uh, people are suffering. Um, I want to get your thoughts about that uh, as a doctor uh, and people coming into hospitals and uh now your practice you don't necessarily work in the, in the emergency room of course you you're a specialist people come and see you especially for their heart and kidney problems and whatever other eight things you do correct that's correct but but you have to understand that you know covid uh or the virus coronavirus uh or the cost you know sars cov2 virus when once it goes once he once it gets inside the body and people get sick a lot of organs are affected you know, the kidneys can be affected, the heart can be affected. And so they might, they, you know, they'll usually call you. They call you as a cardiologist to come and see a patient that has, you know, a heart complication from COVID um, or kidney, you know, failure, which is not very common, but it's becoming something that we're seeing, especially with this COVID patients. They have kidney renal failure. And once they have renal failure, um, it's usually a very bad prognosis. You know, I had a friend of mine, um, a very dear brother, I don't know if you know him, was, you know, um, Brother Joe, Jonathan Adewumi, you know, he just passed away recently from COVID-19. Uh, it's very uh, devastating for me because I've known for a while since like when I first got to this country. Very nice brother. Okay. Um, so, and he also had kidney failure, you know, when he had COVID-19. So that's always a bad prognosis. So yeah, they we get called to see, you know, some of the patients with COVID. Mm, mm. I heard um, 
and I want to just going to be a special topic on Wednesday that I'm going to handle. Um, I get calls a lot from different doctors and nurses mm -hmm. and because of the health and wellness week right now, um, because I am part of the media, I get a lot of calls and people telling me stories about this and this and that. And I got a call today from a nurse um, and uh, she was fed up with uh, what was going on on her, her boyfriend. I was having chest pains, went to the hospital, and they looked at him and said, oh, you have chest pains and you have COVID-19 and go home and quarantine yourself and do this. That's what they, that's what happened. Um, and she's a nurse and they, she, she came back and said, this is what they told me. And she was like, oh my gosh. So they walk around for, with mask on in, in there, you know, in the house. And then she said, you know, go see you. Cause he has a bad heart also or something like that. Mm -hmm. And she sent him to go see his cardiologist just to make sure everything was all right. And the cardiologist looked at him and did a thorough exam and said, ain't nothing wrong with you. You don't have COVID-19. I told you that. And, um, uh, and gave him the, I think gave him the x-ray and told him to go back to the hospital and say, look, there's nothing wrong with me. I do not have COVID-19. Um, and I'm hearing that a lot from a lot of nurses and doctors who work in the emergency rooms that people are coming in and people just checking them off because they're forced to do that. And I'm hearing that the, the, the nurses and the doctors are forced to put down COVID-19. Um, and the hospitals make money off of every patient who has COVID-19. Things like $38,000 or something like that per patient. Um, but that's going around. Like, have you heard a lot about that uh, in your endeavors? No, I haven't. I mean, that would be very surprising uh, because medicine, you can't, I mean, you can't monetize medicine. You can't capitalize medicine because it's in people's lives. What I, One thing I do know, and, and it's, it's basically across the board, is that we're seeing that, um, you know, cardiovascular disease is used to be, well, it's still the number one, you know, killer in the United States and in the world, really. Uh, most hospitalizations in, in most hospitals are usually cardiac related. We've seen a drop in that with the COVID-19 mm -hmm. situation. So a lot of people are staying home. And I think there are really there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, some of the patients don't want to come into the hospital because they don't want to get sick. So um, you've got patients who are having chest pains and who are just trying to ride it out because they're thinking, if I get to the hospital, I'm going to get COVID-19 and then, you know, everything right. will be downhill from there. So they're not really presenting or coming to the hospitals to seek medical help. So um, it's the other way around, right, okay. So, I mean, I, you know, I'm sure it's multifactorial. I'm sure there's a lot of reasons, but, I, you know, the ones that I know, oh, they, even, in practice, right, even in my practice, mm -hmm. you know, we have, you know, you call patients who don't want to come into the office. So we do a lot of telehealth, telemedicine. Uh, but, you know, I think the warning that we need to sound to people is if you're having chest pains, you know, you need to, I mean, if, you, if, if it's really persistent and it's really, you know your body. You know, if you feel, you know, if you don't feel well, you need to come to the hospital because, um, the danger of not coming to the hospital is far worse than you coming to the hospital. Really. Uh, things are much better now than you know when you, when COVID first started out, when the pandemic first started. You know there are a lot of ventilators, and you know uh, we have more equipment to help people out. So I think you know heart condition is very unforgiving. It's a 50-50. If you have a chest pain, if you're having a heart attack at home, I mean that's a dangerous situation. So. I think people need to come to the hospital, you know, to seek medical attention if you're really sick. How would somebody know they're having a heart attack? Like I'm just sitting around, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, it, you know, there's no sign that comes up that says, you know, heart attack. So how do I know I'm having a heart attack? Well, you know, I mean, we we are very smart people. Right? You you know your body more than anybody else, man. You know yourself more than anybody else. You know uh, your body well, more I, than your doctor do. You know your body more than I do, even if I was your doctor. So, but you know, if you're having chest pain that is located on the left side, sometimes in the center of the chest. You know, if it goes to your arm, goes to your jaw, um, is relieved with, you know, some certain medications or you're not exercising, you know, if you exert yourself, the pain comes on. If you don't exert yourself, the pain disappears. You know, you're having an argument, you know, with someone, the pain comes on, you know, when you relax, the pain goes off. You know, you're getting dizzy, you're getting short of breath. Um, you know, you have this feeling of impending doom, like something as bad is about is about to happen. Um, that's that's a heart attack, you know, waiting to happen. Now, in diabetic patients, you know, they don't typically have those symptoms that I told you about, because diabetes has a way of numbing the nerves, causes neuropathy, what we call neuropathy, and so 
a lot of times they might not have chest pain. They have what is called a silent heart attack. You know? And also in women, mm. the presentation is usually different. Women. They might not have chest pain, they might have back pain, they might feel like bloating, they might feel like you know, they're just uh, you know, uh, symptoms of um, reflux disease or indigestion or things like that. Or sometimes they might even have a right arm pain or right-sided pain, which is very atypical, which is not the usual symptoms that we see. But for women, we've known that um, the symptoms are very different. But the common theme is you just know that something is not right. But especially if you break out mm -hmm. in the sweat. If you're sweating during the winter time, winter period, you shouldn't be sweating during the winter period. Especially, you know, you, mow, you, know, you, you, you know, you shovel snow, you mow your lawn, you just start feeling a, a pain, that is, a tightening. Or sometimes people describe it as a mm -hmm. elephant sitting on your chest. You just feel like something is sitting in your chest is not, you know, going away. Those are some of the symptoms of, you know, heart attack, heart disease. Right. It's now it, it's that uh, and and I'll make the crux and I know it was a time and we talked about it earlier. Most of my work right now is sedentary work. Um sitting in front of the computer twenty hours a day. I'm working, I'm doing things. You get more of an urge to eat something or snack on stuff that you probably shouldn't want to do because you're sitting there doing the same thing all day long. Um and I noticed at one point um, I would walk to my house and I'm going to walk to the train station and there's a hill I would have to walk up or, or coming back from the train, there's another hill to walk up. So I go uphill and downhill or uphill and downhill. Um, and I just I got out of breath from walking a breath hill or like, you know, that's wasting my, at that point for me, playing football all my life and the arts and so on and so on, I'm like, you know, my cardiovascular is shot. I need to, you know, get my cardiovascular system in order and to, you know, do that. So I started taking another train where the stop to my like five stories underground. <laughs> you gotta walk up a bunch of stairs to get to the street. Um, and I would start doing that and walking up those stairs just to increase my blood flow and my heart rate and to, you know, do that. And I notice now I don't uh, I don't get out of breath anymore. Uh, you know, I just kind of got my body back to exercising again and, you know, I got to get my ass back in the gym and do some things. But, you know, so moments like that, is it just sometimes just, you just out of shape, you just need to get in shape. So that's a and, good one. you know. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm finished. I'm doing my water. Okay, great. So, so I, good job. So, yeah, I think you made, you made a, you made a very good point. You, you were just probably the condition. But again, I need to warn people, you know, so I don't want people to get, you know, this feeling that, you know, if you're having shortness of breath, climbing the hill, that is due to the conditioning. It's better you get it checked out and make sure it's not a heart problem because it could be a heart problem. That's also one of the signs of heart problems when you're exercising and you get short of breath. But certainly when you get short of breath, you know, uh, especially if you're someone that's been very active a lot, you know, for a long time, and that just happens because you've been sitting, sitting around, that can be the conditioning, you know? And so you just have to get back into the, you know, your routine, walking around, uh, walk two miles every day or every other day, things like that. The other thing that I've noticed is, especially men, is, you know, we have the pot belly, right? You know, when mm -hmm. people have pot belly, what happens is they have abdominal breathing. So when, you're, when mm -hmm. your belly is, you know, big, there's a tendency for you to breathe with your abdomen. When you're breathing, uh, yeah. when you're breathing with your abdomen, you're not, you're not, you're not breathing the way you're made to breathe. You're supposed to breathe with your chest. Your chest should rise up and down. And so your, your, your lungs fill with air. So when you're breathing with your abdomen, you're not really working your lungs. And so you decondition very easily. And then the next time you try to exercise, your lungs, they're not used to you know high volume at a very rapid pace. And so you get short of breath very easily. Um, but again, you know, the best thing is to check, make sure your heart is fine and this is not a heart problem. And then you can say, well, this is safely deconditioned. And, um, and then you get back in the gym or do what you do, you know, what you, what you do. The thing is, you know, as Americans, you know, you know, we're very, we don't, we don't just as a group, we don't exercise a lot because, you know, it's, it's fast paced. Everyone's going to work. You sit at your desk, you're the computer, we're in a sign, you know, computer age, social media age, everything is online, you know? Uh, so we don't really get time to exercise. Everybody's stressed out. You know, it's, it's a high intensity environment, but you have to find time, uh, you know, to walk around and, and to exercise yourself because sitting on your desk for 24 hours, I mean, 10 hours every day, it's not the best if you don't exercise. You know, you have your, your heart is a very mobile organ. 
and it needs a mobile heart, you know, body to to keep it going. The heart needs to keep pumping. The heart doesn't want to stay. And again, like I said, you know, the slower you move, the faster you die. You just have to keep moving. You know. Um, and that's, and, and, and that's funny because I just I'm very conscious of that, and I'm very conscious of me not moving like I used to, and not doing the things like I used to uh, because of what I'm doing now. And I just tell I just told Jasmine the other day that um, I'm going to go back into the arts, and I'm going to do something brand new that I've never done before, and I'm going to go take Tai Chi, and yeah. so you know, so I can learn to breathe again properly. You know, as you said, you know, saying uh, understanding your breathing is very, very important. So I figured Tai Chi would be great, really good for that. Um, and it helps to yourself bring peace to you because stress is, is another thing that is very important for your, your heart. Um, when people get stressed out, very, you know, very, very. And I just you know, just what you mentioned, you know, I, I used to play tennis before. And then the first time I got back playing tennis, I played two games and I felt like I was going to pass mm -hmm. out the court just two games, you know? And um, I slowly walked my way back. And some weeks ago, I played 33 games. I think I played three hours nonstop of tennis, you know? So that's just what the conditioning can do to you. And, you know, you, you might feel you're going to work, you're walking around, you're conditioned, but really you're not because you're not really exercising very well. But you talk about stress, you know, and that's some, that's another thing that we're not, a lot of people are not paying attention to. Or we're not focusing on COVID-19. We're talking about the treatment. We're talking about the management. But we're not focused. I know you brought out, you know, one of your... Um, uh, speakers did a very great job talking about you know the mental health issues. I think a couple hours earlier, but it's something that, right. You know she did a fantastic job by the way. So it's something we're not talking about is you know the stress that this whole situation is having on people. You know mm -hmm. um, the virus itself has a pro, you know has you know damage to the body. There's a you know damage to the economy, and there's the fear of the virus itself, which has nothing to do with the virus. There's the mm -hmm. collective grief that we have if you've lost a loved one, for example, or you have somebody who has the virus itself that you're dealing with. Um, mm -hmm. The social distancing, which is needed, is also, you know, has negative effects once it's, once it's you know, for a prolonged period of time, because we're not used to just, we are social human beings, we're social beings, right? We need to have people around, we need to interact with people. Social distancing mm -hmm. is needed for this situation, but, you know, it's tough. You know, physical distancing is tough because that's not the way we are created as human beings. So that in itself is causing depression right. for people with anxiety. There was a study that was done by a McKinsey group. I think it was done last month that showed that 37% um, of people are anxious or depressed. And 27% of people were actually anxious but not depressed. And 6% of people were depressed. Only 37% mm. of people were neither depressed or anxious. You know, that's just mm. a sample of people. That tells you, you know, over 60-something percent of people are either anxious or depressed just by staying at home. So, and that's something that we need to start thinking about, you know, because eventually what's going to happen is once we once we get over this hump of this COVID-19 situation, we're going to start having people, a lot of cases of behavioral health challenges and mental health challenges. I mm -hmm. mean, look at it in 2007 and 2008, the Great Depression. We've learned lessons from that. There was 13% in, I mean, increase in suicidal rates, you know, from the Great mm -hmm. Depression. Um, that's what depression mm -hmm. does. I mean, there was 46,000 lives were lost due to unemployment or inequality of pay, you know. Um, so this is something that people are binge drinking, people are using recreational, you know, drugs. And, of course, this is going to be a vicious cycle because what happens is when you're using all these drugs, you know, you're going to have loss of productivity. You know, right. the WHO, you know, um, made a statement some time ago, and they estimated that, you know, um, anxiety and depression um, cost a trillion dollars globally in loss of productivity. Wow. A wow. trillion dollars globally from loss of productivity, just from anxiety wow. and depression. And, and wow. I'm sure a lot of people are experiencing these things, minor depression, but it is time for us to start focusing on these things right now so it doesn't become another, another small and, you know, endemic situation of mental health and behavioral challenges with, you know, PTSDs and, and things like that. Because people have loved loved ones and it, it's very difficult to, you know, deal with it. Especially, you can't even bury your loved ones because you can't even gather together. I mean, I yeah. lost a, very, a close friend of mine who was who was my pastor. I was the assistant pastor and he was the pastor of my church, Tunde Opata, you know, very wonderful, wonderful guy. He passed away and 
and uh, you know, we just had to have a small funeral for him. I mean, because we couldn't have a lot of people be there because of the the, of the situation, and that's very mm -hmm. tough, you know, even for the family to deal with. So, this is a kind of the things that we have to start talking about mental health, behavioral health challenges, and how to start thinking about it right now. We don't have to wait for the whole situation to be over, and then we have a, another wave of mental health challenges and people committing suicide and things like that. You know? Yeah, and that's it, and that's and and and. and all those factors, I think, mentally, fear, and everything else affects your heart greatly. I always tell people, don't be afraid of things. Try to, to stay calm, and because that does affect your heart. And the more you pile on your heart, like then you might be eating very well, but fear and anxiety and those things will start to affect your heart. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, they will start to affect your heart as much as the food you eat. Right, because, you know, <laughs> when you, I mean, there's stress hormones, right? There, you know, there's, there's adrenaline or epinephrine, or epinephrine, there's, you know, cortisol. These are, these are, these are hormones that are really released when, you, when you're stressed out. And adrenaline mm -hmm. basically speeds up your heart rate. So if you have heart disease, you don't want your heart rate to go up. Because mm -hmm. if you have high blood pressure, there's something we call the double product. So your blood pressure times your heart rate will determine how much oxygen your heart uses. So if you have oh, no. if your blood pressure goes up and your adrenaline, you know, makes your heart rate go up, cortisol causes, you know, fluid retention because that's what it does. So your blood pressure goes, your heart rate goes up, your double product goes up, your heart is overworking itself. It's needing more oxygen, it's doing more work. It's gonna affect it. You know, cortisol, you know, um, also is a stress hormone. Like I said, you know, it causes weight gain. Uh, people are, you know, very difficult to lose weight. Uh, you have problems sleeping, you have, you know, water retention. Um, and these are some of the things that, you know, stress does on, you know, does on your body. So mm. um, stress definitely um, is not good for you. Not good for your kidneys, not good for your heart, it's not good for your mental yeah. well-being or your psychology, you know, period. So. And, 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 and it's funny that cause stress to me is really is, is always a big factor in people's lives and their health. And a lot of like, because right now, because we're forced to be inside, there are people who are forced to be inside with people they don't want to not used to being inside with for, you know, they, you know, they can't get away from them. And, you know, we're not going to talk about those people, whoever it is, but, you know, but I, yeah, but, yeah, but you know, some people just feel out of there and really like somebody they, they got to be with 24 seven. And, you know, and I would say, man, we're going to really have the test of the human spirit very soon. Cause when it gets warm and we're still quarantined, and people can't get outside. It is it is hot in the house. Everybody has a air conditioner, and you got five or six or seven people in one, you know, in the two bedroom apartment, and you're forced to be there. It's gonna be very stressful. That's a for bad. People. That's a bad recipe right there. Yeah, it is. And you know, I, 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 people, there's there's a, there's a most divorces like in the sports world. Most athletes get divorced after they finish playing, after their careers are over. You're and I told. People. Or during the off season, yeah. You know, yeah. Right, you know, say so that's because they're home now, not used to being home. Their wives aren't used to them being home, and now they're home all the time with nowhere to go now. And the wife has run the family and the household for you know years and doing her thing. Now here you are upsetting Alpha Cart, just sitting around, you know, getting on her nerves. So you know things happen. So stress is a big and it comes different areas. Whether it's job or lack of money or you know whatever situation is, people are stressed. I know uh, Yana will, will will talk about that uh, health and finance on Thursday. Uh, she'll talk about that part. You didn't but you don't want to miss that, by the way. You don't want to miss that. She's very good. Yeah. Very good. yeah oh yeah. yeah. Everybody knows Yana. I, I'm not gonna hold you too much long. I know our time is is getting close. We got a couple of questions, and I just want to throw out there. Uh, Tony said, "I thought that deep breathing." Or abdominal breathing was the best way to relax, especially while practicing Tai Chi, Gi Kong, uh, and Gi uh, um, Chi Kong and Gi Kong in meditation. So you said you're supposed to breathe from your chest, not your abdomen, right. correct? Yeah. Okay. So you, so, can practice, Tony, you can practice deep breathing, you know, breathing on your chest, for, you know, just breathing with your chest muscles as well, because that's that's the physiology, that's the way your body is created. So you can do deep breathing, slow breathing. Basically, you need to control your breathing. You can do that with just um, breathing with your chest. I mean, I guess it's it's faster, it's easier if you do it abdominally, but you can do it with your chest as well. 
So basically when they tell you to do deep breathing, it's just, it's, it's a way to regulate your body and basically slow your heart rate down. When you do deep breathing, it slows your heart rate down as, as well. So, but you can do deep breathing. Everything is all about practice. If you practice breathing, I do a lot of deep breathing with my chest well when, when I play tennis. Um, and so you can do that as well, but it's faster for you to do abdominal breathing. Um, you know, when you tell people to breathe, breathe through your mouth, just to slow mm -hmm. down, but you can also do it through your nose, but it's faster okay. because your mouth is bigger to take in the, the, the air. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see, we got another question here. Amelia, she said, you know the difference from a heart attack and uh, from heart trouble and indigestion? My friend said she was burping and having indigestion and when it was early signs of heart trouble. Was she telling the truth or was she exaggerating? Well, they're very similar, actually. But, you know, the thing is with, with burping or, you know, uh, indigestion is, is related to food. You know, um, if it's heart trouble, your pain is not related to food. It's not like when you eat the food, you know, the, the pain gets worse. Or sometimes the pain is relieved with eating. Uh, if you have ulcer or indigestion, sometimes, you know, uh, when you eat, you know, the pain, the, pain change, the pain intensity changes, right? Mm -hmm. But again, we have to also look at what we call the, you know, the... Uh, the, uh, the risk factor. So if you're diabetic, hypertensive, you know, you have cholesterol problem, you have a family history, and you're thinking you have indigestion, it's better you get it checked out first. You know, it's better mm -hmm. on the side of caution. But if you're a 27 year old, no, ma no medical history, you're very fit, and you're, you're feeling that, I mean, you can try some antacids and see if it works. If it doesn't work, then you need to see medical attention anyway. Uh, the other thing okay. I tell people is, you know, just press, just put your two fingers, you know, put it on your chest sometimes, you know, and, and press against the chest wall. If you feel the pain, if you, you get the same kind of pain that you felt before, then maybe it's not heart trouble. Maybe it's not a heart problem because if it's hard, then you shouldn't be feeling the pain when you press the chest. It might just be from okay. the chest wall, things like that. But again, okay. the, key, the key is when in doubt, you know, check it out. Okay. All right. I was just beating on my chest to make sure I'm feeling up and stuff. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Amelia also wanted to know, uh, which everybody doesn't need to know. Uh, where do you practice now? I know you're not here in New York in, 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 any longer. You are somewhere else. You're in where are you right now? I'm in the Sip City. The who city? The Sip City. Sip City. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm about to say those who don't know it, that's Mississippi. Uh, if I crooked letter, crooked letter I, crooked letter, crooked letter I, humpback, humpback I, Mississippi. <laughs> That's where he is, um, and uh, they can reach you at uh, uh, Olero Timmy, uh, Olero Timmy, Madero dot com. Because that is your full name. John is your day name, correct? John, uh, John, and, John is my, John is my uh, Christian name. My, my name, right? Name, yeah. um, and so Olero Timmy, Madero dot com. You can uh, uh, go to Doctor Madero's website there and uh, get more information. And then if you're on Instagram, at Badero, Badero Timmy on Instagram, you can catch him there also. Um, I had another question real quick to ask you. You are, if someone is, oh, uh, I lost my question. I went to something else and totally lost my question, but it, it's okay. A, I probably, you ask a question about COVID and the heart or how does COVID affect the heart, kidneys? Was that, was that your question? Yeah, yeah, let's do that real quick. Yeah, how does that, you just jump on in with that. Yes, sir. Okay, great. So, so, um, so COVID affects the organs and, you know, I would say three basic ways. There's something we call the cytokine, the cytokine release syndrome, the cytokine release syndrome or the cytokine storm. There's also the organ crosstalk and then systemic effects. So with a cytokine release storm, these are like proteins, small proteins that the virus, you know, you know, uh, makes your body release those proteins. And what, it, what, what those proteins do, they cause widespread mm -hmm. inflammation. They can cause inflammation in the kidneys. They can cause inflammation in the heart, which is called myocarditis. They can cause inflammation in the heart and make the heart muscle weak, which is called a cardiomyopathy. If the heart muscle gets weak, it's not able to pump a lot of blood to the kidneys. The kidneys get involved. If the kidneys get infl inflammation in the kidneys, you have renal failure. Um, and it also causes inflammation in the lungs as well. It affects the lungs. You have, you know, lung, I mean, water, fluid collection in the lungs, um, the problems with breathing. And then you, you have what is, again, what I call the organ crosstalk. So uh, within the, 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 uh, the lung tissue and the, the kidney tissue, there's an interrelationship which 
uh, this cytokine is cost and, and it becomes a problem. And then it also causes my rhabdomyolysis, which is, you know, your muscles begin to break down sometimes. And also we're having now some of the patients are experiencing blood clots. It's something that people are experiencing a lot in the hospitals these days. So having blood clots with you, having to treat them with the blood thinners. And so these are some of the ways in which the COVID affects the kidneys and it affects, you know, the, uh, the heart. But Basically, once you have the cytokine storm, that's a very typical, very difficult thing to treat um, because it's kidney failure, heart failure, blood clots, all types of stuff. And um, it's, you know, yeah, it's a very tough situation. And then it also causes what we call ARDS, acute um, uh, respiratory distress syndrome, where the, the lungs just become filled. They, you know, lungs are usually a whole structure. They're like, um, they have a lot of air, but they come, become filled, they become solidified and you can't really breathe very well. And so they have to move your ventilators and try to push air into your lungs. And that's usually a very tough situation. Yeah. I heard, I was reading, it, it, it's funny you mentioned that because I heard, um, I watched in, I read an article and I watched a video from a uh, doctor in the ER. And he was saying they were treating coronavirus wrong. They were pumping too much air into people's lungs, uh, trying to, they would, with the ventilators and whatever, they were doing too much. And it was, it was overworking the lungs and destroying their lungs. And that was his take on it. He said, we got to stop doing this. People are dying from that. So well, I don't I, know. You know. I, don't, I don't know about that. You know, when you have, when you have ARDS, the respiratory distress syndrome, you know, mm -hmm. you're not able to breathe. Okay. So they have to force the air. There's something we call the PEEP, right? The PEEP, you know, expert, I mean, the, uh, the PEEP is, is, it's the kind of the the the, um, the pressure that they use to open the 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 air spaces inside your 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 lungs so that air can get into your lungs so you can have exchange. Um, right. The peak airway pressure is very different. Maybe he's talking about the peak airway pressure. That's usually causes a problem, but the peak doesn't really cause a problem. And, they, and 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 these are you know professionals. They've been doing this for a long time. They're not. I don't think that's causing the problem because if you don't use the peak anyway, you can't get you can't get the oxygen into the lungs. So the patient is not going to breathe anyway. It's going to die. So. Uh, I'm not convinced that, that the PEEP is doing a lot of problems or damage. I'm, again, I'm not a pulmonologist. I'm not a respiratory uh, specialist, but from my own limited knowledge, I don't think the PEEP is really causing a problem. I think the, the doctors, the respiratory doctors are doing a great job, you know, trying to solve, you know, a lot of times before the patients are intubated, you know, their oxygen saturation is very low, you know, and they're, you know, already going bad by the time they get intubated. I think that's probably one of the key issues. If, you know, if, if things happen earlier, who knows, you know, but I mean, it, it's, it's hindsight is 2020. We can't sit here and be, you know, criticizing people for what they do. I think they're putting their lives on the line every single time, every single day. we got to give them a lot of credit. So mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think there's anything they're doing wrong. Um, I think some of the patients are presenting late and, you know, and just that, that's, what, you know, the way the situation is sometimes, you know, you don't know if this is a flu or something, you think it's going to go away and then it gets worse and people have problems breathing. Like I said, my, my friend that died for the Joe, you know, he went to three different hospitals in New York and was turned back and he was told that he wasn't, you know, he wasn't critical, you know, and I told his brother, Bobby, you know, and I talked to him, I said, you need to get into another hospital. And eventually they got into a hospital in New Jersey and he was intubated the next day and he was there for like 10 days and, you know, eventually he passed away. You know, very devastating. But again, I'm not convinced the people is doing you know, a lot of problems. Again, I'm not a pulmonologist, but, you know, that's something for the experts to talk about. Okay. Uh, so in, in people, in my last question, it will, will um, people who, Work out a lot. I mean, it was something like Yana was teasing me some time ago about what well, you know. I don't, I'm not in the gym anymore working out, and she was like, "What happened to all the muscles you had and stuff?" Hey, <laughs> you know, whatever. But and I've heard people talk about if you like those who are bodybuilders who are continuously pumping a lot of weight and their chest is expanding a lot. Is that good for your heart? You mean like to, you know, be the most weights like that? You know, bodybuilders and stuff like that. Is that good for your heart? Well, I mean, as long as you're as long as you're exercising, I mean, but if you a lot of times, you know, the bodybuilders, they start using some other products, you know, that basically yeah. um, that damage the heart, especially the heart valves. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think that's where the problem really comes in. But, you know, if you exercise, I mean, I, I think exercise, one of the consequences of exercise, you're going to have hypertrophy. Your muscles are going to you know, get bigger. But if you're using all these enhancing, you know, drugs and medications, basically, that are overworking your heart and affecting the heart valves. That's where the problem usually comes in. I don't think exercising and building, you know, you know, naturally itself has um, a detrimental effect on the heart. It's when people start using all these other enhancing drugs and medication that start putting the stress on the heart, you know, um, 
and you know affecting the valves just like you know weight loss some of these weight loss products you know they do affect the heart and cause heart pro valve problems and things like that and that's when they are detrimental to the heart all right. Well, I, I, I definitely appreciate you. Um, I know uh, a lot of people are chiming in. They're loving uh, what you're talking about. They're, they're loving the interview. Um, you are in Mississippi, so uh, you, you're not making house calls right now here in New York. Uh, and uh, if, if you were, that would be a hell of a bill that you would get. I had to just go to the hospital <laughs> and, uh, you know. I, I, will, uh, I will do it for free and tell them to send you send you the uh, the, the the checks. How about that? I don't know right now. Don't go. Just <laughs> <laughs> you know right now. Just don't go. Go to the hospital. Just put your fingers on your chest and see what's going on. <laughs> uh, but all right, uh, Doctor Bedell, you are a very uh, incredible brother. Um, I like talking to people who are incredible. And um, we have a lot of people in our community that people don't know about. I'm quite sure nobody knew who you were um, until now. Those of you, those who are, who are watching, the the man of a, a thousand degrees and uh, a specialist in you know a dozen you know, a dozen different things. Uh, the only person in the world who does what what you do, uh, cardiology and nephrology. That's incredible, and we need to. So I salute you. Uh, for that, for just being incredible and sharing your information and knowledge with the people here on Facebook and for the Harlem Health and Wellness Week, because we are trying to do 360 degrees holistically of health. And I thank you. Have anything else you want to say before we close this out? I gotta go get my baked chicken. So it was my pleasure. You know, all glory goes to God. I cannot, you know, complete this interview without talking about God. Everything that we do comes yes, from sir. God. We have to give God the glory. Um, you know, when you're at home, it's nothing to do. Pick up a book, read something, pick up the Bible, whatever it is, you know, pick up a vacation, you know, join some online course, get that master's degree. That's something that you want to do online. But again, always mm -hmm. give God the glory. Um, there's nothing that we do. It's, it's, we are alive today because of the grace of God. It's not because you and I are smart or we're great or we know what to do or, you know, mm -hmm. we're washing our hands and that's what's really preventing us. You know, people wash their hands and they still get this disease. I and mean, this is real. People die, you know, so. Uh, we shouldn't take this for granted. You know, we're here. We're believing. We take life, you know, very seriously. Be, you know, um, you know, be um, just be thankful for the kind of life that you have. You know, help people. Um, be helpful. Let's, you know, cheer up one another. Let's be there for each other. Let's not be divisive. We are. We're here together. We are. We are a collective group of people. And, um, you know, let's let's listen to the authorities. Let's listen to, to the health experts. Let's all speak in one voice. Let's not cause confusion. Um, and um, let's pray for each other. Let's help each other. Let's be there for each other. And I thank you with that. I will close with exactly what you said. You said it earlier. Helping people is very important. That's what doctors do. That's what nurses do. That's what firemen do and police officers are supposed to do. And we all are supposed to do it. And it says in the Bible, the greatest testament to a man is man's ability to serve others. And I try to live by that. I'm always trying to help people and do things for 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 people, uh, and I thank you for being here and helping us to learn more about the heart. And hopefully, we can get you back again. Uh, I'll, I'll find some more things to figure out and, and talk, you know, to you about. And I definitely appreciate you, Dr. Barrow, and I'm sure everybody else out there does. And uh, we will talk again soon. Next thank time you. we come to see you. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you, my yeah, brother. It was my pleasure. Appreciate it, yeah, brother. Have a good day, ladies and gentlemen. We are done. I'm going to end this right now with Dr. John Badero talking about the heart and the kidneys and everything else that goes along with the body. Thank you for watching. Harlem Health and Wellness Week will return tomorrow with some more great stuff. Go to h2w.nyc for more information and to rewatch this interview and every other interview that there was. See you guys later. Peace and blessings. I love you all. Good night.